How's everyone doing today? How's our, how are my besties? Ooh, that's a good compliment. Uncharted type music. I still need to play that. I have yet to. That's going to probably be a retro for me. I actually just recently got my uh, capture card upgraded and stuff to the point to where I should actually be able to do like Uncharted. Is that PlayStation? Do we know if Uncharted... Um, by the way, closed captions are available for anyone who might need them. If you don't know me yet, if this is your first time here, my name's Bombshell. I'm a variety streamer. I stream 6 p.m. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. We usually do a fair amount of video games, but we're just really here to hang out with each other. That's what it's all about. So if at any time you have questions, you want to know about something, feel free to just ask because I'll stop the whole thing just for you because you're worth it. Um, <laughs> it's a PlayStation title. Perfect, because guess what I got sitting right over here. Badoosh! That's my baby. So for those of you that aren't uh, aware, if anybody's been here since the beginning, you, they can fill you in. Um, the entire channel was launched, started using a PS5. Um, I'm still pretty new to streaming. Pretty new to Twitch. Um, <laughs> pretty new to being back to video games. I didn't really play, like, Fortnite and stuff. Like, I'm just recently back. Um, within the last couple years. So there's a lot of titles, like Uncharted, that I just simply haven't played yet. So if there's stuff like that that you think, um, would be fun to watch me play, um... Be sure to let us know in uh, the Discord. And if you're not in the Discord, we'd love to have you. You can find the link to join here. Um, real quick shout out to Viper, first in chat. That's going to get you a free entry into the raffle. For those of you that aren't familiar with our raffle, you can find out more here. Or at any time you want to put exclamation mark raffle into the chat. Um, when I say raffle, I'm actually talking about this thing. <clears throat> this is our Wheel of Names, um, brought to you by wheelofnames.com. Um, you can get this for free. There's no money to have one of these. Um, ours is full of names of uh, wonderful community members that have used um, points, um, bits, gifted subs. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. I'm coughing because I'm winded. I was rushing to get here in time. Even though I, I delayed the stream, I still struggled to get here. How funny is that? So, if anybody would like to join um, our Wheel of Names here for these um, wonderful prizes that we have, it's merch. Um, the merch you can find, um, the link of what we're winning, always at exclamation mark raffle. Um, at the, I guess you j we'll just call that the raffle command. So if you use the chat command raffle... Um, it'll show you a link of what it is that we're actually raffling off for that month. And this month is a kitten chibi um, t-shirt. A unisex kitten chibi t-shirt. Why is my chat module not loading on um, my other computer? What the hell is happening? Computer 2 is down, y'all. Computer 2 is down. Which is where I have most of... That's why I mostly watch chat. <coughs> my mini PC is supposed to be just dedicated chat. So the fact that it's down is disheartening, to say the least. Um, also, a special shout out to my bestie and our mod in the chat right now. I think that's our only current active live mod. Let me double check. Yes, that is correct. Uh, lovely. Ladies and gentlemen and people who do not limit yourself to such things, um, please be sure to, you know, give, give, give the mod due respect because, you know, she's here doing, you know, her mod duties. It's, it, it's, not, it's not an easy life. Mo she didn't choose the mod life. The mod life chose her. <laughs> I love you too, Angel. 
I'm so glad you're here. Okay, so, um, believe it or not, I got the schedule up. Um, I got um, promo up. I hit. I, I did the Twitter and the Discord. I did all the things I was supposed to do. Oh, good. Tell her she can buy one if she wants. And I think that would be the first sale. I think the only things that have come out of the merch store so far are um, raffle prizes. But that's fine. I'm just happy that folks like them because I, I chose this company specifically for their quality. Um, they Their referrals are, people rave about them. They're a co-op and um, they're real easy to work with. It feels real low stakes, um, low energy. Well, not low energy. They're, they're high energy, but it's like, it doesn't feel frantic. It feels like a, a good sustained energy. Um, and I can't say enough about them. Um, feel free to check them out, y'all. You know, merch store. Or you could just go to their website, slakermerch.com. Um, my collection you can find, of course, at slakermerch.com slash collections slash transex bombshell. Yeah, I've thought about putting the Instagram <coughs> and the tags and the Twitch and stuff. But, um, you know, honestly, um, you can, um, you can start a conversation with it and it doesn't have to feel like, I don't want it to feel like NASCAR, if you get what I'm saying. Um, I want it to be wearable. Like yours, it's like a cute little girl sitting on a bomb and you're like, what's going on there? It's not necessarily like, oh, I'm shoving it in your face. You know what it is. You have all the information. It's supposed to be a cool t-shirt. And like, I could have all of the information on there. I could have like the website or um, the, the social tag or something. But you know what I want on there? I just want it cool like like the the fun thing for me is that that's the logo that's the logo that you'll find like last month it was in the middle of the merch wheel that's the logo that we were um we were using for the channel icon for a good while until i started getting good enough cameras to to put my my photo my photo seems to always be the best um i channel icon People want to see who it is that's streaming. And the one right now is even kind of dark. Like I should probably do it with a nice bright face picture. But that fits stunting. That's that's a fit. Like that that was my Valentine's Day dress. And I was on. Like my makeup was on point. And I was at like, that was actually a really nice restaurant that just had all these plants and flowers up for Valentine's Day. And I just took a photo in front of it. <laughs> anyway, um, um, it'll be swapped out soon. I find that having the same one for too long for my social and my logo and stuff hasn't really benefited me. Um, I seem to gain more as I'm changing it as it's fresh as it's new. Um, yeah, I don't know. Secrets. <laughs> With that being said, we're going to jump into the next book. Um... If you haven't kept up with this story, uh, this has been honest. Oh shoot! Honestly, this has been the story of a lifetime. Um, why is this on the books? <laughs> the uh, I had a microphone with a rubber duck. I don't even. Let's not even go through what was in there. We're wasting time. Um, we got to book five. Was it? We weren't with four. We were five. I think we finished four. We're going into five. Um, they moved the date to... to they moved the date? That's pretty crazy. Wow. Um, I stream tomorrow, so I'm going to miss it. But I'll certainly catch it after. Is what it is. Um, so... Last we left, uh, in book four, <clears throat> um, there, we found out, um, 
the unicorn that was um that took over the herd turned out to be a sorcerer or the essence of a sorcerer that when he died he took over he became um whatever died nearby he took over the body um and so they had found a way to defeat <clears throat> that entity um and that's what had happened um in book four <clears throat> We were moving on to book five. Book five is um, the book of Earth. So, again, we are reading this with permission. Um, this is by the author John Peel. Uh, he's a British author. Um, wonderful fellow. I've actually ex uh, had a few exchanges with him. Um, fantastic author. Um, he wrote for Star Trek, Are You Afraid of the Dark? The Where in the World is Carmen San Diego series. Might be familiar with it. Um, so, we're going to read the Book of Earth by John Peel. And that puts us, I'd say, well, is this, there's 12. So, the, the next book will put us halfway. So, do with that what you will. Um, real quick, I need to grab a blanket or something because my ass is sticking to this chair because I'm wearing these cutoffs. So give me just a second. I'm, ah, I'm just going to grab some... Unicorn blanket. There we go. Here we go. I'm gonna use it here. Diadem. Worlds of Magic. John Peel. Where are we at on the ads? I'm gonna make sure we just. We're gonna go ahead and run one. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. After that, um, it's just going to take a minute and 30 seconds, uh, and then we'll get started on Diadem Worlds of Magic. Um, but I do just want to real quick um, remind everyone, he's an author of numerous best-selling novels for young adults, including installments in the Star Trek, Are You Afraid of the Dark, and Where in the World is Carmen San Diego series. He's also the author of many acclaimed novels of science fiction, horror, and suspense. Mr. Peel currently lives on the outer rim of Diadem, on a planet properly known as Earth. Um, and that's our little forward. Uh, this is for Craig Walker, is who he actually dedicated this one to. A reminder, this is book five. And... Um, if you haven't been with us, it's involving our um, heroes, Helene, Score, and Pixel. I don't have a hair tie over here. Well, let me grab a hair tie. Really? Not, not a one. Well, there's one back here. Okay. 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 Are we ready? Ah. Book five. Worlds of Magic. The Book of Earth. By John Peel. 
Prologue. He must come to Earth, Tashiro said, looking down at the girl in the wheelchair. Everything had been set in motion. The trap has been laid. The young girl nodded. It seemed almost to exhaust her. Score is my only hope, she said softly. My only chance to be freed from this prison. But will all three of them come? The amulet can only compel score. The Japanese man moved to stare out the window. We have used what meager powers we have, he replied. I have managed to see something of what has happened on other worlds. We know Score has bonded with two friends, Helene and Pixel. I do not think it likely that they will abandon their friend. Quite the contrary. I am almost certain that they will insist on accompanying him to here to Earth. And then, the girl prompted, she sounded hopeful at last. Then our business associate, Mr. Caruso, will find them for us, Toshiro replied. The girl shifted uncomfortably. We seem to be placing a great deal of reliance on this man, she observed softly. She gestured at a computer on the desk beside her. I have done some checking up on him. He is generally known as Bad Tony and was in jail until a few days ago. Can he be trusted? No, Toshiro answered honestly. He has admitted that he has a reason of his own for wanting score. He is, after all, the boy's father. But while he cannot be trusted, he is predictable. He will not betray us because we have the power to return him to the custody of the police. He barely escaped from jail that held him the first time. A second attempt is not likely to be successful. He has a great fear of confinement, and this makes him controllable. Knowing the weaknesses of an enemy gives you power over him. Knowing the weaknesses of an ally makes him an unlikely to desert you. Toshiro lowered his head slightly. Mr. Caruso can be managed. I am certain, and his men will capture the trio when they return to Earth. Very shortly, they will be in my hands. He turned back to the girl, and then Score will have to help free you from your curse, from your current state. The girl slapped her hand down on our unfeeling legs. He must help me, she cried. I cannot endure much more of this waiting. He will help you, promised Tashiro. I will see to it. Score will help you, or else face my wrath. All right, so now we meet two characters that apparently um, Score can help. I guess Score can somehow cure them. We're moving on to chapter one. When Score awoke, it was to an immediate surge of pain. He gasped and struggled to sit upright. Take it easy, Helene said to him. The concern in her voice surprised Score. You've had a rough experience. You're telling me, Score asked. His chest ached. I feel like someone tried to rip my heart out. He looked around the small bedroom in the castle the three had adopted for themselves. Pixel and Oracle were also there. Both looked as worried as Helene sounded. What happened to me? You collapsed in pain, Pixel said. We brought you here so you could recover. He glanced at the black-clad man beside him. Uh, Oracle has some bad news. Score tried to recover some of his normal humor. <laughs> when has he ever brought us good news? He asked. Then he looked at the messenger. He wasn't actually real. Not in the normal sense of the word. He was a projection of some kind who had once served the triad. Now he was free. And he had decided to help the three of them. Whenever he showed up, though, it always spelled trouble. So what was the bad news this time? I'll never be able to play the violin again. 
It's worse than that, I'm afraid, Oracle replied. You are not likely to get better in the immediate future. Quite the contrary, in fact. You are in serious trouble. This would have depressed Score, except he could hardly get more depressed than he was right now. He could remember fainting because of the agony that had torn through his body. The idea that it could get worse made him sick. So what's wrong with me? A bad heart or something? Incurable cancer? I hope he doesn't have that. Oracle shook his head. No, it's nothing medical. It's a magical attack, and it's just beginning. Score sighed and laid back on his bed. Oi, another mad magician? No, Oracle replied. This is actually low-level magic. Very primitive. And unfortunately, very effective. Helene glared at him. Can you stop being cryptic for a minute and actually explain what you're talking about, she demanded. I'll try. I'm sure you recall that when you went up against Sarman... He used dolls to control you. To animate these dolls, he needed your true name, form, and substance. Once he had those, you were forced to do whatever he commanded. Pixel caught on. So you're saying that someone, somewhere, has made a doll of score and is using it against him. No, not a doll, Oracle answered. This is very primitive magic. What they're doing is using something very personal that belonged to Score, and they've put a wasting spell on it. This spell will attack him through the object they have, causing cumulative harm. It will attack progressively until it kills Score. Two questions, Score broke in, before his friends could start. First, what does the person have of mine? Second, how do I stop them? Oracle shrugged. What they have, I cannot say. Only that it isn't something simple, like your old clothes. It must be something intimately connected with you. Something that means a lot to you. Score snorted. There's very little that's important to me. So what about question two? That's easier and harder to answer, Oracle admitted with a sigh. Marvelous, Score complained. Trust you not to have a straightforward answer for me. It's easy in the sense that you must track down the object and recover it, Oracle explained. It's harder because I do not know what it is, where it is, who has it, or why they are doing this to you. You will need to know all of that before you can recover it. Then it sounds as if we're going to have to get busy, Helene said practically. At least we have a good idea of where to start, added Pixel. The only place Score could really have left anything that's valuable to him is back on Earth. We've been with him pretty constantly ever since, and we'd have noticed if he'd left anything valuable anywhere on the way. When I left Earth, I didn't exactly have a lot of possessions, Score told his friends. My mother died when I was nine, and the less I saw of my father, the happier I was. He never gave me presents, and I never gave him anything. Nevertheless, there must be something there that is of great value to you in some way, insisted Oracle. Perhaps you will discover what it is soon. And that means a trip to see Shannara, Pixel decided. She's our best bet here, and if anyone can help us, she can. Score realized that Pixel was correct. Shannara was another magic user who lived on a world called Ron. She wasn't as powerful as the three of them, but she had some very strong specialized magic. She was also far more experienced than they were, having practiced her magic for at least ten years longer than they had. She specialized in magic that could disguise her true appearance, enabling her to become a kind of living any kind of living creature she desired. Score thought this was something of a waste because, in her normal form, she was a very beautiful woman. It was another of her abilities that they needed now, 
Shannara ex uh, excelled in discovering information. She had a magic pool of water that she used to see other worlds and peoples. She called this magical site Scrying. Using this, she might be able to locate what was being used against Scorn. Helene nodded. Obviously, having reached the same conclusion, she looked down at Score. You must stay here and rest, she said. Pixel and I will go and see if she can help us. Forget it, Score answered. I'm the one who's being attacked, and if Oracle's right, the attacks are only going to get worse. I'm not staying here, waiting to die. I'm coming with you. In between attacks, I'm perfectly all right. This was actually a lie. He did, in fact, feel terrible. But he simply just couldn't lie there hoping his friends would save his life. You're being impractical and stubborn, Helene complained. Yes, and I know they're usually your fields of expertise, jokes, <laughs> score joked. But for this once, I'm practicing them too. He managed to sit up. Anyway, it looks like the trail leads to Earth and you'd be totally lost there. It's my home, so you'll need me to help navigate and help you survive. Plus, I could really go for a slice of pizza. This I understand. If you've ever been to New York, you, mm, uh, the pizza is seriously really good. Uh, okay, Pixel gently placed his hand on Score's shoulder. You don't fool me, he said. You're not in as good a shape as you pretend. Then he shook his head. Unfortunately, you're also right that we would need you on Earth. If that's where the trail leads us. So I agree that you will be better off coming with us. Plain scowled. You're on his side? She grumbled. I think he should stay here and conserve his strength. Even if the suspense kills me? Complained Score. No way. He took a deep breath and managed to stand up. The room stopped swaying after about 20 seconds. I can manage, and I want to find out who's doing this to me. Then I'll rip his heart out of his chest with my bare fingers and see how he likes it. Shaking her head, Helene said, Well, I seem to be outvoted. You're coming along then, but I still think you're being very foolish. Score managed a weak grin. Hey, you want me to stop a lifetime of habit now? He put a hand on her arm. I know you're only thinking of what's best for me, he added seriously. Trust me, going with you is a lot better than waiting here. I couldn't stand that. Put yourself in my position. If this were you being attacked, would you let me and Pixel go off without you? Helene smiled slightly. You'd never make it without me, she replied. <laughs> All right, you've made your point. But I don't want you to complain later that you made the wrong decision. Cross my heart, Score promised. If I have one left after the, uh, the next attack. <laughs> he turned to Oracle. How long will that be? Oracle shrugged. I cannot say. This was the second attack. And it came eight hours after your first. Perhaps it will be another eight hours before the next. Or perhaps it will be less. It is possible that the attacks will come closer together as they go on. Well, you're a real ray of sunshine, grumbled Score. He turned back to Helene and Pixel. Then it sounds like the less time we waste, the better. We should head for Shannara's palace as soon as possible. You know, once upon a time, I thought that magic could solve any problem. But the more we learn, the less confident I feel. And the less safe. He grimaced. Not that I've ever felt safe since my mother died. Even though it had been years before, the memory of this brought a lump to his throat. His mother had been the only person in his life Score had ever loved or trusted. Until maybe Helene and Pixel and Thunder, the leader of the Unicorn Heart, had been befriended. He couldn't remember much about his mother except an impression of dark hair a radiant smile, and a vague memory of a locket. A locket. <gasps> of course! The 
pocket. Thor slapped his forehead. Boy, am I ever dumb. Well, you won't get any argument from me on that, Helene promised him. I've just realized that it could be what that we're looking for. Score explained, I was thinking about my mother and how I don't remember much about her, but I do remember a locket she used to wear. She would sing me to sleep at night, and I would see that locket swing back and forth over my face. She had a lock of my baby hair in it for the first, from the first time I ever had a haircut. That could be it, or, agreed Oracle excitedly. Do you have any idea where it is? Well, I know where it is in score it answered. Shortly before I came onto the diadem, I went back to my old apartment. The only thing I found was a letter my mother had hidden there. There was no sign of the locket. I guess my father must have taken it. So, we look for your father then, asked Pixel. Helene said sympathetically, I know how your father mistreated you. This can't be easy for you, having to face him again. Face him, Score shook his head. We can't do that. He's in prison, which means he can't possibly have the locket. It's got to be somewhere else, and I don't have a clue where. To be honest, he was glad that he wouldn't have to deal with bad Tony again. He lived in terror of his father as long as he could, for as long as he could. He lived in terror of his father for as long as he could remember. He'd endured cruel words that, and crueler beatings, and he still shivered at the thought of ever having to meet him again. That was about the only thing to be glad of right now, that whatever happened on Earth, he wouldn't have to face his father again. Uh oh. We know he's going to have to face his father again. I'm going to take a quick break. Uh, like two minutes, not even. I'll be right, right back.
Okay. So, we have found out the one thing that, um, the one thing that Score wants is to not have to go back and face his father. And we just found out Score's father is out of prison and he's working with some kind of wizard to summon Score back to Earth. And there's some kind of spell that is hurting Score. It is literally hurting Score. And um, it's just going to get worse until Score is like in pain and like actually get, or actually it, it will kill him. He'll actually die. Um, okay. That being said, we're going to continue on. Helene was worried. Although Score was talking and acting bravely, which was unusual enough for him, she could tell he was nowhere near as strong as he claimed to be. His flesh was pale. His veins showed slightly beneath the skin. His eyes were dark ringed. And his body moved slowly. If she had any choice in the matter, she'd have insisted that he stay behind. But she'd been outvoted, and she'd have to live with it. She only hoped that Score could live with it. Even though he had the right to come along, a journey to Earth was going to tax his strength severely. And if there was any trouble, he might even prove to be a liability. There was a tightness in Helene's throat as she realized that she had grown to be very fond of Score. If anything happened to him, it would really hurt her. This surprised her, because she'd never been really close to anyone her own age before. Growing up in her father's castle, she'd been the daughter of Lord Voitrin, and therefore far too good for anyone to associate with. Or else, in her disguise as the boy Reynold, she'd been far too lowly for anyone to bother with. Her father had been very distant and aloof, completely uninterested in her except as a convenient bargaining tool, aiming to marry her off to cement an alliance. Her only true friend had been her father's old war trainer, who had kept her secret and taught her to fight. And now she'd allowed herself to get friendly with both Score and Pixel. They at least treated her as an equal, though... This hadn't been very easy at first for Score. She couldn't lose one of her few friends now. She'd prepared herself for the portal casting. To travel across the worlds to, of the diadem, portals were necessary. They opened a rift in a space between two worlds, but they could only be formed by magic users of some strength. The diadem was formed in a number of circle, circuits and travel had to take place between two adjacent worlds. Since their current location on Dondar was in the inner circuit, there was no direct access to Earth, a rim world. They had to cross first to the middle circuit world of Ron. This was where Shannara lived, in the mountains above the planet's goblin kingdom, and then on to the outer circuit world of Treen. Helene opened her book of magic and found the correct spell. She and Pixel then joined their strengths together and formed the portal. A jagged, deep blackness formed in the air in front of the three of them. Helene briefly wished that she had taken the time to say goodbye to her unicorn friend, Flame. But this was an emergency with no time for non-essentials. She gestured for Score to go through the portal first in case he stumbled. Then she followed. When Pixel came through, the portal vanished, leaving them on Ron. A cold wind whipped into them, and Helene shivered. She'd forgotten just how chilly it could get on the top of a mountain. Luckily, it was a fairly nice day, with no more than two feet of snow and ice to wade through as they struggled against the bitter wind. Heading for the shimmering castle about a quarter of a mile away, it shone in the cold sunlight, looking as it had been formed from the ice itself. The three of them staggered on, Helene and Pixel both watching Score intently in case he needed help. He was clearly aware that they were watching him, and he pressed on, 
refusing to acknowledge that he might be in trouble. Although Helene almost admired his stubbornness, she hoped he wouldn't take it too far. When they reached the courtyard, the gate was open and they stumbled inside. Here they were shielded from the stinging wind, which made them feel a great deal better. The three of them hurried into the main building. Despite the veneer of iciness, this was made of good solid stone, covered with beautiful rich tapestries that made the castle a good deal warmer than the world outside. You must be frozen, Shannara said as she hurried to greet them. If you'd let me know you were coming, I'd have met you with furs. Oracle has only just arrived and told me you were on your way. Come on, come on, it's warm in my study. The lovely blonde sorceress. ushered them into her room and waved them to chairs. They were streaming, there were steaming mugs of delicious scented liquid awaiting them. Helene sipped hers with the pleasure. It tasted unusual with a hint of chocolate and malt. It warmed her almost instantly. Oracle was standing beside one of Shinar's bookcases. There was no sign of blink. Shinar's fuzzy red panda. He was intelligent and magical himself. He was also incredibly lazy and was undoubtedly off somewhere taking one of his naps. Oracle tells me you have to return to Earth, Shannar said, sounding quite concerned. She looked at Score. That someone has an amulet that belonged to your mother and is using it to attack you magically? Right, Score agreed. He seemed to be quite happy that the sorceress was worried about it. Helene thought it was typical of Score to enjoy being the center of attention. And thought, even though it was because he was being attacked. We thought, they, they, we thought that you might help us out by finding the locket. I can do more than that, Shannara promised. Once you get to Earth, you won't have the strength left to create a portal to return here. Because your magic there will be too weak. Blink and I will cross to Treen with you and I'll prepare a portal for you to return again. I'll be able to pick up your telepathic signal to open it. Thank you, Pixel said gratefully. I hadn't thought about that, but you're right. It'll be a big help. Shannara gave them all a smile. I'm happy to help you in any way I can. After all, if it weren't for you, the diadem would be under the control of either, either Sarman or the Triad by now. We all owe you a tremendous debt of gratitude. She crossed to her scrying pole, which stood near the large fireplace. Helene watched her, uh, watched her with interest, hoping to learn something about the process. The sorceress waved over the still waters, murmuring a spell just under her breath so that Helene couldn't make it out. Then she turned and called sharply, Blink! From a pile of pillows, a furry snout poked into the air. I'm busy, a lazy voice answered. I'm having a lovely dream about food. If you don't get over here right now, Shannara ordered, I'm going to send you a positively nasty nightmare about starving to death. Move it. With a long, suffering sigh, Blink staggered to his feet. The red panda shook his head sadly. She'd do it too, he complained. She's so mean to me. Helene knew that this simply wasn't true. Shannara actually looked after Blink very well. But the panda was lazy and perpetually hungry, and Shannara used her threats to make him do some work from time to time. In fact, Helene realized Shannara and Blink were actually very fond of each other. This complaining was simply part of the relationship that both of them secretly enjoyed. Blink padded across the table and jumped into Shannara's arms. Together, they gazed into the scrying pool. At first, nothing seemed to happen. But Helene could tell that Shannara was drawing magical power from Blink, using it to boost her own ability. A picture began to form in the pool. Helene was fascinated. Staring down at it, it showed a stretch of grass. And people 
moving around. They were all dressed very oddly, and some were using odd mechanical devices with two large wheels joined together somehow. The people were riding them. It looked to be very awkward. Score, trying not casual, leaned across and frowned. It looks like Central Park, he said. Helene gestured at one of the people balanced on the wheels. And what is that? She looked. It looks very dangerous. Score gave her an incredulous look. That, that's a bicycle. I wanted to get some for us, remember? You expect me to get on one of those crazy things? Asked Helene, astonished. I don't see how anyone can possibly get it to balance. I'm not doing it. Score managed to laugh. The brave warrior woman, he teased, scared of a bicycle. I am not scared, Helene snapped. I'm just cautious. Whatever, scoffed Score. Helene felt her cheeks burning. We don't have time for them anyway. He turned back to Shannara. Can you tell where the locket is? No, Shannara admitted. It's guarded by magic. Not high-grade magic, but enough to be confusing to me. Besides, this earth of yours is a strange place. I don't necessar I don't understand very much of what I see. So, even if I do detect something, I might not be able to explain it. So you understand it. But I'll keep probing, and if I find out anything, I'll let you know. Great, Score looked relieved. Now, there's just one more thing I need you to do. He gestured at Helene and Pixel. We have to get these two looking like regular New Yorkers. Helene scowled at him. And what's wrong with the way I look, she demanded. Personally, I think you look great, Score said hastily. On you, chain mail looks great. But it's not exactly what the fashionable folks are wearing on the Park Avenue. And they definitely don't carry swords. Helene frowned and looked down at herself. She wore knee-high boots with daggers hidden inside the left one, leggings, a tunic, and chainmail covering. Her sword was strapped to her side. She couldn't understand why anyone on earth would have a problem with this, unless maybe they had the same prejudice as her home world. Women aren't allowed to carry weapons on your world, she asked a little hurt. She'd hoped to escape this problem. Not just women, Score assured her. Nobody on my planet carries a sword. Then how do they defend themselves, Helene asked practically. They don't have to, Score explained. We have police who are supposed to do that. Ah, oh, Helene thought. She was start finally starting to understand it. These police are your professional warrior cast then, she smiled. Then I shall become one, and there will be no problem. They're not warriors, really, Score answered. They enforce the laws. Oh, Helene said. Where had she gone wrong? They are the local lordsmen who t make certain his edicts and taxes are carried out, and I would be recognized as an outsider. No, that's not it either. Score threw his hands into the air. Look, why don't you just take it from me that you can't wear a sword, and you can't impersonate a police officer? This is my world, after all, and I know what I'm talking about. Helene touched the hilt of her sword sadly. I do not like the idea of leaving it behind, she confessed. But if I must, I must. She unbuckled her belt and laid it on the table. Now am I acceptable? Not quite, Score eyed her critically. We have to get you some modern clothes. Shannara, can you help out? Of course, the sorceress bent over her pool again. I'll just focus on in on one of the locals and duplicate her clothing. She concentrated, and one image strolling onto the grass sprang into sharp focus. Helene gasped as she saw the girl. She was wearing nothing but two small strips of cloth and sandals. I am not dressing like that, she exclaimed in horror. 
The people of your world, Score, have no concept of modesty. Score grinned as he looked at the blonde girl in the pool. Tank top and shorts? They look great on you. She, then he blushed. I mean, hey, you work out a lot. You've got the body for it. Score squirmed as Helene glared at him. Never, Helene said firmly. I am a lady born, and I will not show off so much of my skin to all casual onlookers. Okay, grumbles, uh, grumbled Score. He gestured to another female figure passing by. How about that one? Helene studied the girl as Shannara brought her into focus. She seemed a lot more acceptable. She had on a long leggings made of some sort of stiff blue material and a white top, nearly identical to the kind of clothing Score wore. It covered less than her tunic, but a great deal more than the tank top had. That is acceptable, she agreed. Good, Score sounded relieved. Blue jeans and a t-shirt. Shannara nodded and muttered to herself. <laughs> Instantly, the required garments materialized on the table. Helene realized that they were her size. Now for, now for Pixel, Score said. Pixel raised an eyebrow. My clothing looks appropriate, he said. Yeah, agreed Score. That's fine. I don't quite know how to tell you this, though. It's the rest of you that's the problem. The rest of me? Pixel was puzzled. Score sighed. Look, I think you look fine and all. But, well, blue skin is kind of rare on Earth. A actually, it's, it's kind of non-existent. Pixel scowled. Nobody on your world has blue skin? He stared at his hands, and then at Score. Finally, he looked at the image in the pool. Well, I can see that most people have pale skin like you, but some have dark skin, he said. He looked at Score again. But not blue? Not blue, Score said firmly. For this trip, you're going to need a disguise. Not a problem, Shannara assured him. I can cast a simple spell that will make his skin as pale as yours. It should hold up even on Earth, where the magic is weaker. Great, Score said. Then let's get to it, folks. He turned to Helene. You'd better find another room to change in. I wasn't intending to do it in public, she replied, sniffing. Though I'm sure that's probably common on your barbaric planet. Only on beaches, he answered. Ah, Helene could barely understand this. Oh, Helene could understand this. A ritualistic area, involved in worship, no doubt. Something like that, Score agreed, chuckling. Sun worship, in fact. A primitive religion, Helene informed him. I might have known. She left the room and found a small chamber where she could change. She removed her normal clothing with a sigh. She'd miss being properly dressed. The t-shirt was simply enough to put on, though she felt terribly vulnerable in it. It offered no protection from attack. The blue jeans, however, were another matter. They were a lot tighter than her leggings, and a lot stiffer. They would be uncomfortable to walk in, and they didn't seem to have any way of closing. Nothing to tie them into place. There was a button, which closed well, and there was an odd gap left open. It was lined with small metallic teeth, with something, something like a tongue hanging, out, hanging down. It took her about five minutes, but then she discovered that if she pulled up the tongue, somehow the teeth meshed together and closed the gap. This puzzled and amused her. Score had mentioned that his world was more advanced than her own, though not as... Not as far as Pixel's world was. But this was the first evidence she'd seen that he was telling the truth. This teeth and tongue apparatus was quite fascinating. When Helene returned to the study, she stopped in shock. 
Pixel's blue skin was now as pale as her own, in scores, and his ears had become rounded instead of pointed. He looked very uncomfortable and depressed. You look fine, Score assured him. I feel terrible, Pixel replied. No offense, but the skin color is dreadful, and my ears feel like they've been sliced in half. You'll get used to it, Score promised. He coughed, <laughs> and his body shook slightly as he turned back to Shannara. Are we ready for the two transfers now? I'd appreciate getting to Earth as soon as possible. Helene realized he must be feeling very sick. Perhaps you should rest, she suggested. She couldn't help but feeling rather sorry for him, even if he did drive her crazy a lot of the time. The longer I wait, the weaker I get, he said. We'd better get to Earth while I still have strength for it. Right, Shannara said. Let's get on with it. It's time for you to go to New York. She glanced down at her pool. Please be careful. That place looks like a madhouse. And we'll be right back with chapter three. I'm going to take a quick break.
And we're back! Alright, so... And so, um, I think the plan is just to, um, double teleport. So they're gonna teleport to this next world, um, which is a rim world, and then teleport again, um, to Earth, which is also a rim world and the ultimate destination. Um, ooh, give me just one more second, I'll be right back. 30 seconds, 30 seconds, I swear. 30 seconds. Sorry. Okay, much better. Let me get a little bit of water. Where were we? Oh, that's right. Chapter three. This place does not... This place does look like a madhouse, Pixel thought as he stared around their landing zone. Score had worked with Shinara to find a spot in Central Park where they wouldn't be observed materializing out of thin air. That sort of thing, it seemed, wasn't likely to be accepted by the people of the city. Shannara had placed the portal in a shady grove of trees. The opening vanished behind them as they stepped through. Though Pixel knew that Shannara could open it from her end on train any time they called for it. Score then led the way to the edge of the park. Pixel thought that the park was rather pleasant, so apparently did the people of New York, who were out sunbathing, playing with toys or dogs, or just walking or relaxing. Pixel caught Helene dis Helene's disapproving frown as she saw some of the immodest clothing the people wore. Well, she was from a world stuck in the Middle Ages, where women all wore long, flowing gowns and considered even having their arms bare as the height of immodesty. Seeing Helene in a t-shirt was astonishing, though. Was astonishing enough. Pixel realized, since she was actually showing her arms. It was different for him, though, of course. Clothing styles in his own world were pretty much the same as they were on Earth. And at least they were on the friends he'd met in the virtual reality. Whether he had seen what his friends had actually been wearing, he didn't know. Since they could make themselves, their clothes, and their surroundings look like anything they pleased. As Scord said, there were no blue-skinned people here. It seemed a little odd to Pixel, but it took all kinds of worlds to make a cosmos. The park was fun. It, wa it was when they left the park that it became a madhouse. Helene gasped and gripped Score's arm as tightly as she stared down the road and the surrounding buildings. Tilting her head back, she stared up at the skyscrapers with a mixture of astonishment and terror. Why don't they fall down, she asked. They're so big, Score frowned. Well, they just don't, he answered. I've never thought about it before. I'm used to it. I guess they don't have skyscrapers where you come from. She shook her head, realizing his arm. 
The houses are never more than two levels tall, she replied, apparently calming down a bit. If anyone builds higher, the houses fall over. Obviously, that is not the case here. No, Score thought for a minute. It's something to do with the girders and supports, he explained. They make the building stronger. I just don't know how it really works. Maybe Pixel does. Pixel shook his head. I've never been that interested in architecture, he admitted. In my world, it's irrelevant. We can build anything we like in virtual reality, so I have no idea how a real house is built. It wasn't the buildings that bothered him, though. It was the traffic. The roads seemed to be absolutely packed with vehicles of all kinds. Some were obviously for the transportation of people and others for carrying goods. There were a large number of bright yellow cars. All of the vehicles were moving at a great speed, often making loud, irritating honking noises, and from time to time one of the vehicles would stop and another at, uh, and another at right angles to the first would then start moving. Added to all of the bustle and confusion, there were people everywhere. Some were dressed casually, others in suits. People carried packages, bags, papers, and drinks. It was a whirl of color and movement one pixel was not used to, at all used to. He generally spent his time either alone in virtual reality or else with two or three other friends. There had to be hundreds, if not thousands, of people here. How can you stand this? he demanded. Score looked puzzled. Stand what? he asked. Gesturing around, Pixel said, All of this noise and confusion, all of these people and vehicles, it's insane. That made Score laugh, at least. It's the greatest city in the world, he replied. Welcome to New York. Helene shuddered. And this is what you consider to be paradise? she asked. It's loud, smelly, and crowded. Yes, agreed Score. Ho. Oh. Helene gave Pixel a look. No wonder Score is so strange, she commented. It must be the result of living in this place. Knock off the insults, all right, Score snapped. He was still looking very pale and tired and Pixel realized that he had to be under a tremendous strain just to stay on his feet. Pixel, can you use your ruby to discover where the locket is located? As Pixel's hand went to his pocket, Score grabbed his wrist in a weak grip. Don't take it out, though. Rubies are pretty valuable here, and someone might decide to steal it. How savage, Helene exclaimed. Is your property not safe here, then? It's probably safe enough, Score answered, but there's no point in asking for trouble. Pixel understood the caution was called for, so he clutched his ruby to try and focus his powers. For the first time, he realized just how small they were. He had become accustomed to having magical abilities that enabled him to work wonders. Right now, though, he felt as weak as a baby, and he knew that he only possessed a fraction of his normal magic. They were so far from the center of the diadem here. Magic was very weak. I get a very vague feeling that it's south of us, he said finally. Other than that, I can't get anything. I feel so helpless here. Okay, Score said with a sigh. I guess that means we better start looking in the most obvious place where I used to live. Maybe if we're closer, your magic will work better. Pixel wasn't sure whether it would or not. Are you sure you can walk that far? He asked, worried about his friend. No, but we don't have to walk, Score answered. He pulled a couple of pieces of paper out of his pocket. I've got some local money, so we can hop a cab. Stand by on the side of the road and hold your arms straight out. One will stop for you. Pixel did as he was told. He watched the traffic hurtling past. Then one of the yellow cars screeched to a halt beside him. 
He opened the door and climbed in. Skor and Helene followed. Helene didn't seem at all happy to be inside the vehicle. The Bowery, Skor told the driver who set the car in motion. Helene looked as if she were going to be sick. She avoided looking outside of the windows and turned to Skor. You ride inside these things all the time? At this pace? Huh? Skor shrugged. Sure. He didn't seem to understand her unease. Then you are clearly more brave than I had imagined, she replied, shaking her head. I do not like this hopping a cab. Are there no horses in this world of yours? Sure, Score gestured outside the window. They were passing the southern edge of Central Park, and Pixel saw carriages being pulled by horses. Then why don't we take one of those, Helene demanded. They don't leave this area, Score answered. If we want to go downtown, this is the easiest way. Helene gritted her teeth. Then I will endure it, but I will not enjoy it. Score managed another weak grin. I told you I'd love to get you onto my world, he said. Now you can see why I was so bad at riding a horse and all the rest of the medieval stuff of yours. Helene shook her head. No weapons, no horses, all this noise and confusion. What a world! The cab driver must have caught this. He grinned and called back. She from out of town, ma'am? Yes, Score replied. Very out of town. Pixel wasn't too disturbed by the ride, and he'd spent the time studying the city. He'd never been in a place quite like this before. He'd only left his own home once, and that was when he'd been propelled onto the diatnum. His own town was a pleasant pace, place of a small, uniform houses, each spaced a uniform distance from the next. Here, though, the buildings were jammed together reaching into the sky, and people and vehicles crowded everywhere. Their cabs moved in spurts of speed and then waited while the traffic cross-traffic had its turn. It was quite different, and Pixel was rather enjoying it once he had become accustomed to the crowded conditions. The buildings were all different shapes and sizes, and some of them were rather attractive. Score spent most of his time dozing, almost dozing, Bo would perk up from time to time and then point out some building or another and identify it. New York Public Library. Chrysler Building. Empire State Building. None of the names made any sense at all to Pixel, but he accepted that they were obviously places where Score spent a good deal of his time. Finally, they reached their destination. Score handed over the green paper and received even more pieces back which didn't make any sense to Pixel. Then they clambered out of the cab. Helene almost fell onto her knees, and Pixel half expected her to kiss the ground. I hate those things, she declared. I'm not going on one again. I am quite sore from all the shaking about, and I feel ill. Well, it's a good thing we weren't going fast, Score told her. Then you might have really gotten sick, he turned to Pixel. Is this any better? Pixel gripped his ruby again. Remembering Score's warning, he didn't take it out of his pocket. Once again, he could feel how weak he was. There was this vague impression again. It's north of here, he said. That's all. North score question? The apartment where we used to live is a couple blocks south of here. Perhaps the amulet was moved by the person who took it, Pixel suggested. If we start walking, I'll keep scanning for it. Maybe I'll be able to tell where it is exactly if we get closer to it. They started walking north. Pixel kept his hand on his ruby, trying to feel where the amulet was. His grasp of the magic was so weak, though, that it would be easy to lose it. Helene stared around her as they walked, obviously noticing many new things. The buildings here were a lot smaller than the ones she'd seen earlier and definitely not as well made. Instead of stone and glass, most were in dirty brick colors and some had been allowed to practically fall apart. 
There were bags of garbage on the street and litter on the paths. There were even a couple of ill-dressed men sleeping in doorways. This place is disgusting, she declared. Why don't the police of yours make people clean it up? That's not their job, Score answered. This is a poor section of the city, and people who live here can't afford to make it better. It's dreadful, Helene decided. How can anyone live like this? Sometimes, Score said quietly, people don't have much choice. It may have been different on your world. After all, you're the daughter of a wealthy lord, and you could get whatever you wanted. This is where I grew up, and it's what I'm used to. I couldn't afford food some days, or a place to sleep, and I had to stay alert all the time. Helene stared at Score in pity. It must have been terrible for you, she said gently. I had no idea being forced to live in this squalor. Knock it off with the squalor, Score told her. If other people hear you, they're not going to be as understanding as I am. They might get offended. That quieted her down for a moment. Then she stiffened and glanced around. Trouble, she said firmly. Pixel and Score immediately paid attention. Helene had the ability to sense danger moments before it appeared. Even with her magic reduced, she could still count on that. For a moment, Pixel saw nothing to worry about. Then, six or seven men moved out from behind an alleyway ahead of them. They didn't appear to be armed, but they were clearly dangerous. Score, one of them said without warmth, or humor. Good to see you again. Score Scout, I doubt that he spat. What do you want, Brio? Brio raised an eyebrow. He was dressed in dirty blue jeans, a dark t shirt that carried some kind of emblem on it, and a leather jacket that had to be uncomfortably hot in this kind of weather. He also wore darkly tinted glasses. Somebody wants to see you, he replied. Tell them to make an appointment with my secretary, Score answered. I'm kind of busy right now. Then I'd advise you to make yourself unbusy, Brio replied. He glanced at Helene and whistled. <whistles> this your secretary, Score? You're moving up in the world. Do you think she'll take some di dictation from me? He grinned, and the other boys with him laughed. What I will take from you, Helene answered coldly, is blood if you do not allow us to continue on our way. Score groaned. Obviously, he'd been hoping that Helene would control her temper. Pixel could see why. Antagonizing these people would not be a very smart move. Listen to this mouthy chick, Brio said cheerfully. You've got guts, girly, he told Helene. And talking like that, you're liable to get them spilled on the sidewalk. He drew himself up and stood in front of her. Now apologize, or I'll have to get rough. He'd clearly underestimated Helene and Pixel almost felt sorry for him. She glared at the young thung, thug. I am not chick or girly, she answered. You may call me my lady if you have to talk to me at all. But I'd prefer if you just step aside and let us go on our way. Brio's expression turned livid. You would, huh? Well, forget it. I'm gonna give you... Whatever he was offering, he didn't have a chance to continue. He moved forward, and Helene was waiting. She grabbed his wrist, twisted it, brought around her foot, and then threw Brio through the air. 
There was the snap of breaking bones as she let go. Brio screamed as he hit the sidewalk. He did, but he didn't move again. But his six companions did. They all rushed toward Helene, who was finally smiling. I'm starting to like your city after all, she told Score, crouching for the attack. Score just winced, leaning against the wall. He was definitely not strong enough to help out. So, Pixel moved to join Helene. He was useless at hand-to-hand -hand combat, but he hoped he could still do a little magic. The lead attacker drew a knife, a wicked-looking blade about eight inches long. Instead of being intimidated, Helene laughed aloud. I thought you said there were no weapons on your world, Score, she called her eyes sparkling. No legal ones. Score answered weakly. Then I shall take an illegal one, she replied, blocking the boy's lunge with her forearm and deflecting the strike upward. She then tacked her, kicked her attacker in the stomach and wrenched the knife from his hand as he fell gasping to the ground. When the third boy approached her with another knife, Helene used her, parry, her blade to parry the blow and then sliced him across his upper arm. Screaming, he fell down, clutching the wound. Back off, one of the remaining four youths yelled. He reached into his jacket and withdrew a small pistol, which he raised at Helene. She stared at it, puzzled. What can that do, she asked. It has no blade, nor arrows. Pixel felt a shock of horror. He kept forgetting that she was from a world without gunpowder. She had no idea what a gun was for and was simply standing staring at it. With a cry, he threw himself against her, shoving her back against the wall. The gun made an almost deafening noise as it went off. Pixel was terrified for a second that he was going to be killed, but he felt the bullet whip past only inches from his head. With shock and relief, he realized the boy had missed. But he still had other bullets. Helene had now realized that the pistol was a weapon. Pushing Pixel away, she whipped back her hand and threw her knife hard. The youth screamed as it slammed into his shoulder with such force that it spun him around. The gun went clattering away down the road and the attacker collapsed, blood oozing from his wound. But that left Helene without a weapon, and the others on the gang were no doubt armed. It would only be a moment before they attacked again. Pixel braced himself, trying to make focus on making fire. If he could set the attacker's clothing alight, it would help. But he wasn't sure he had the magical strength. There came the sound of a siren. It had to be the signal for a truce or something. Because when they heard it, the gang members ignored their victims. They scooped up Brio and the other two whom Helene had wounded and retreated. Helene was grinning, happy again. She loved to fight, and this had been her idea of fun. It was Pixel's idea of something to avoid, of course. And he was glad that it was over. He went to join Score, who was barely able to stand up. As he did so, a blue vehicle screeched around the corner and skidded to a halt beside them. Two men dressed in blue uniforms jumped out and both pulled out guns. Okay, one of them said, up against the wall, quick. Helene glared at them. More thugs, she growled. Don't worry, I can take them. No, Score protested. These are the police. Don't fight them. Oh, Helene stared at the men. The Lord's retainers? Then why are they threatening us? Against the wall, the first policeman repeated. This is your last warning. Do as they say, Score insisted. Pixel obeyed. But Helene looked ready to fight. However, she finally copied Score, facing the wall with her hands up. One of the policemen then searched them quickly. Helene gave a shriek of protest and almost punched him out. She calmed down only when Score shook his head. Right into the car, the man ordered. 
We do not need to hop a cab, Scors Helene said stiffly, glaring at him. We will walk wherever we're going. The policeman glowered at her. You'll do as you're told, kid, he informed her. Into the car, and no more wisecracks. Scor put a hand on Helene's arm. Please, he begged. Just do as they say. We're in enough trouble as it is. <coughs> Why are we in trouble? asked Helene, puzzled. We did nothing wrong. But they don't know that, asked, asked um, but they don't know that, Score explained. Come on, please. Very well, Helene said, sniffling. But I will tell you once again that I do not like this world of yours at all. Relax, Score muttered. I have a suspicion the feeling's mutual. We're just going to roll right on into chapter four. Score was totally exhausted, and being booked at the local precinct wasn't helping his mood much. He could tell that his strength was being drained, and he didn't think that he had a great deal of time left before it would kill him. Even walking was causing him pain. Unfortunately, the police weren't very sympathetic. Gang warfare, the booking sergeant grunted, glaring at them. Why don't you young idiots get real lives? This is my real life, Pixel answered, puzzled. Score winced. The police naturally thought Pixel was being sarcastic, and that didn't improve their mood. Maybe I should answer most of the questions, Score suggested. You two aren't really uh, up on what they're talking about, he turned to the sergeant. My friends are from out of town, he explained. We were attacked by a gang. We're not part of a gang ourselves. We just defended ourselves. That's all. So you say, the sergeant growled. He peered at Score. What's wrong with you? Are you on something? No, Score answered, though I'm starting to wish I had some medicine. I'm just sick. The sergeant's scowl softened a bit at this. We'll see about getting you a doctor then, he conceded. Just as soon as we booked you in. Now, name? He was typing this into a computer. Ouch, Score couldn't answer that one honestly. He gave his real name. The computer was bound to tell the policeman that Matt Caruso had run away from Child Protective Services and that he'd be returned to them again. There was no way he was going back there. On the other hand, the police might just find the record anyway, whether he cooperated or not. What to do? If he hesitated too long, the cop was going to get suspicious. Score, he finally said. That's not a name, the policeman said. That's a gang name. What's your real name? Score, he insisted. The policeman sighed. You're determined to make this hard on yourself, aren't you? Okay, what about personal details? Address, any relatives in town? Score could imagine the response would be if he answered that one honestly. Yes, my father bad Tony Caruso, currently in prison. No way. He shook his head. I told you, we just got into town. We were going to look for a place to stay. Then where are you from, the sergeant said, before you came into town. Treen, said Pixel helpfully. Score groaned. Queens, the cop said, misunderstanding the answer. What street? You would know it, Score insisted. Look, we didn't do anything, and all we want to do is be let go. We've got things to take care of. I'm sure you do. And so do I, the sergeant looked at Helene. Come on, you seem like a nice kid. What's your name? Helene had obviously caught on that it wasn't wise to give her true name. Reynold, she answered, and I'm not a kid. I'm the daughter of a lord. She's from out of town, all right, the sergeant decided. English, huh? That explains her snooty attitude. Score held out a hand, which shook, which shook no matter how hard he tried to hide it. Please he urged Selene before she exploded again. Just let me do this, okay? She glared at him. I had thought that these police of yours were supposed to enforce the laws. Why then are we imprisoned while the people who attacked us without provocation are still free? The sergeant sighed. Look, Missy, we've got men out looking for them, but I doubt we'll find them. 
In the meantime, we've only got your word that you're innocent. And you doubt my word, Helene was getting really incensed. I demand to meet the lord you serve. I shall insist that he flog you for insulting a noble like that. To Score's relief, the cop laughed at this and then grinned at Score. Is she always this bad? He, and no, Score answered. Usually she's worse. The sergeant chuckled and then turned to Pixel. I don't suppose you have an honest-to-goodness name either. It's Pixel, he answered seriously. Great, the sergeant shrugged. A cute who doesn't do drugs, a dame with an attitude, and now a pixie. Whatever did I do to deserve this? He looked out at them. I'm holding you overnight, he told them. If there's no evidence um, against you by the morning, you can all go. He gestured to his desk. Now empty your pockets. Helene shook her head. What I own is none of your business, she said. The sergeant sighed again. Look, we can do this the easy way or the hard way. You can either empty your pockets willingly or have a couple of officers do it for you. Take your pick. Helene looked as if she were going to argue again, but then she looked at score. He knew he had to be a sight right now. It was all he could do to stand up. She gritted her teeth and emptied her pockets onto the desk. Score and Pixel followed her. The sergeant and both policemen whistled and stared at the pile of gemstones. You three have been on a spree, haven't you? The sergeant said. Where did you get those? They were given to us, Pixel replied. They're ours. You're a little too young to own a fortune in jewels, kid, the sergeant answered. You must have stolen them from somewhere. No, we didn't, Score said. He'd been trying to stay calm, but it was getting harder for him. I'm willing to bet you don't have any reports of missing jewels that match those. They're ours, and you'd better take good care of them. We want them back when you let us out of here, he swayed, and then fell into the closest chair. Now will you just lock us up? I need a rest. One of the policemen felt his pulse. It's erratic. He announced. You better call your doctor fast. Score was glad that they were finally doing something right. It wasn't their fault that they couldn't figure out what to do with three magic users, of course, but it was frustrating. The problem was that there was really wasn't much of a doctor could do for them. They simply had to find the amulet. Bad Tony steepled his hands and leaned forward over his desk, staring at Brio. The young man was pale and battered. At least it proved he'd been trying to do his job. I sent you to bring me my son, Tony said coldly. You're here, but my son isn't. So where is he? Brio swallowed nervously. Ooh. He knew that it was not a smart move to get on the bad side of Tony Caruso. And he obviously didn't have good news. With the police, he replied. And how did that happen? They came when they heard gunshots. Tony demanded, There should have been no need for guns. My son is a coward. I was certain he would cave in and come with you. It wasn't him, Brio said. There were a couple of other kids with him. One of them was a really good fighter. He paused and licked his lips. She fought us off. She? Echoed Bad Tony, astonished. You mean some girl beat up you and Johnny and put Dave in the hospital? Brio looked utterly miserable. But he knew better than the light of his boss. Yes. Terrific, Tony scowled, thinking furiously. There has to be some way to salvage this operation. 
He could do nothing himself since the police were still actively looking for him, which left him only one choice. He had to inform Mr. Toshiro. The businessman didn't have a record, and he would be able to free score from jail. After that, Tony could act. He looked up at Brio. Get out, he said, disgusted. You're lucky I'm in a good mood. I'm going to be reunited with my son, and family occasions always brings out the best in me. But one more mistake, and they'll be forwarding your mail to the bottom of the East River. You understand me? Brio nodded, and then beat a hasty retreat. Bad Tony reached for the phone and dialed a number he memorized. He had to get the wheels moving as soon as possible. What he had planned? Couldn't wait for much longer. The doctor had given Score a shot and then laughed him in Pixel alone in a small holding cell. To Score's surprise, whatever he'd been injected with seemed to have helped a little. His head was fuzzy, but he didn't feel quite as weak. Pixel sat beside him, obviously worried. How are you feeling? he said sympathetically. A little better, Score answered. But it's some kind of medicine high, not a cure. The magical attack is getting worse. He didn't have the strength or the wits to lie about his condition. If we don't get the locket back by tomorrow morning, I'm going to be dead. And we're stuck in here, Pixel fumed, slamming his hand on the bars of the cell. And they separated us from Helene. If we were all together, we might be able to plan an escape. Score laughed. It was a thin and watery laugh, but he couldn't help but be being amused by Pixel. Pix, she's a girl. They don't lock girls and guys together in New York. It's not considered polite. Then we simply have to get out of here on our own, Pixel said firmly. It's up to me to come up with a plan. Good luck, Score replied. And then he lay back, trying to conserve his strength. His body felt terribly weak, and his pulse was racing. It was as if he were on the edge of a huge, swirling whirlpool that would sooner or later suck him in. He was going around the edge, not quite lost, but far too close for comfort. Well, said Oracle's familiar voice, I have to say that the three of you have the most amazing ability to end up imprisoned. Is it a hobby? Score groaned. Don't you ever turn up when you could actually be some sort of help? He asked. I'm willing to bet you're here with some dire warning, as usual. You'd lose that bet, Oracle answered rather smugly. I'm here because Shannara has been able to discover something. The problem is... She can't understand it. But maybe you can. This is what she saw in her scrying pool. A piece of paper appeared in front of them with these symbols. So we have a where. This says you end. What does this side say? This says you start. Okay, so you start and you end is on the other side. There's something in the middle that says like IS and then this says where. Where you end. So where you start and where you end. And it's some kind of like island. But then there's another part and this part of the paper says just beware. Know that. And this is some kind of he, she, hybrid, it says she, it's he, but it says sh, he, s-h-h-e-e, she, she, he, she, is it he, she? <laughs> okay, um, <laughs> okay, back. Um, so they've got this piece of paper floating in front of them. Um, as Oracle vanished, Score lay back. About as much as always, he grumbled, if he'd only brought a hacksaw and a cake or something. The humor was lost on Pixel, of course. 
Now, I just want to rest. The door leading to the main part of the police station opened, and the booking sergeant walked through. Score groaned. Can't I get any rest at all, he demanded. The sergeant had his keys out and was unlocking the cell. Why didn't you tell me you were the guests of Toshiro Corporation, he asked. He looked worried. This was all a mistake, right? You aren't going to file a complaint, are you? I might if I knew what you were talking about, Score replied foggily. He managed to sit up with Pixel's help. What's going on? There was another man in the doorway. He was Asian, dressed in an impeccable gray suit and carrying a hat in one hand. He gave a slight formal bow in Score's direction. My apologies, he said. I have explained to the police that you are my guest and they have realized their error in arresting you. Please, come with me. Pixel helped Score to his feet, but the sergeant shook his head. Just the one of you. Score shook his head and then wished he hadn't. It took a minute for him to stop feeling dizzy. Then I'm not going, he said. It's all three of us or none of us. This seemed to puzzle the stranger. And I'm not going anywhere with you until you tell me who you are. The sergeant seemed to be upset at this demand. But he looked at the man for a clue as what to do. It's very irregular, he complained. The boy is, as you can see, in need of a medical assistance, the man said politely. It may be that he is a trifle confused. Would you allow me to speak with him alone for a moment? The policeman hesitated and then shrugged. He backed off down the corridor, keeping the cell in his sight. The man stepped into the cell. Who the heck are you, Score demanded in a low voice. I'm not going with anyone I don't know and trust, even if it gets me out of here. I am Toshiro, the man replied. The head of Toshiro Corporation. I need your help, Mr. Crusoe, and I am in a position to help you in return. He leaned forward and said softly, I know where the amulet is. Score stared at him in surprise. Maybe he would be saved after all. What do you know about it? That without it you will die, Toshio answered. Now, please, come with me, and I will be able to help you. Score nodded. He didn't know what this man really wanted. But if it led him to the locket, then he had no choice but to agree. Only Pixel and Helene must come with me, he insisted. All three of us, or I stay here. Toshiro looked frustrated. But then he nodded. Agreed. He turned and snapped his fingers for the sergeant. Score sighed and settled back. Let Toshiro work out the details. At least this meant they were getting out of jail. And apparently, onto the trail of the locket. He wished he knew who this Toshiro guy was, and... What he really wanted, but for the moment, he had to trust the man. He could only pray he wasn't making a huge mistake. And that's chapter four. I'll be right back with chapter five. Give me two minutes and I'll be right back.
On to chapter five. Helene could not understand why Score thought so highly of his planet. of his. She had been here just a few hours, and so far nothing good had come of it. Being locked in a small cell with two strange women had done nothing either to calm her down or relieve her fears about score. The two women with her were obviously used to this routine and stayed out of her way, which suited Helene fine. It gave her more time to think and plan an escape. The problem was that she was too worried about Score. He had been looking really ill when these police people had forcibly separated her from her two friends. A tough-looking policewoman had rudely insisted that Helene could not stay with Pixel and Score. Now, all Helene could do was worry. Her powers were very weak on Earth but she managed to conjure up a small flame while she had her back to her cellmates. With time, she'd hoped to melt the lock of her cell, but it would be best to wait until everyone went to sleep before trying this. But how long could she afford to stay here with Score so sick? Then the policewoman returned, looking slightly embarrassed. She unlocked the cell and nodded to Helene. Come on, she said. We're letting you go. Why didn't any of you tell us you were with Toshiro Corporation? Helene didn't know what the woman meant, but she didn't intend to let on. You deserve to be told nothing, she said haughtily. The way that you have treated me... Oh, great, muttered the policewoman. I smell a lawsuit. Again, Helene didn't know what the woman was talking about. But she had discovered a long time ago that if you were aristocratic enough, nobody asked if you understood anything. She strode down the corridor toward the exit without waiting for the woman to catch up to her. When they were back at the sergeant's desk, she saw that Score and Pixel were already there, accompanied by a stranger. Pixel was supporting Score, who definitely looked worse than he had before. She hurried over to them. He's getting weaker, Pixel confirmed. But Mr. Toshiro says he knows where the amulet is. Hope began to flood back into Helene. She hadn't wanted to admit it, even to herself. But she had started to brace herself for the thought that they might not be able to save Score's life. Now, she was so relieved that they were on the right track at last. Hold on, Score, she encouraged him. We'll save you. You'd better, he murmured, or I promise I'll come back and haunt you worse than Oracle does. He still had his strange sense of humor, at least. Helene turned to the sergeant and held out her hand. We will take back those gems now, she stated. The sergeant nodded and handed over three padded envelopes marked with their names. They're all there, he assured her. I will check that, Helene replied with a sniff that showed precisely what she thought of his assurances. I will check that. so haughty um but he was right and their belongings were untouched she pocketed her own four gems and slipped scores into his pockets pixel took his own now we must leave here mr toshiro announced do you require help with mr caruso it took helene a moment to realize that mr caruso was actually score no she answered he's our friend we'll manage she took one of Score's arms and helped Pixel to lift him up. Together, they followed the stranger out of the police station and to a waiting vehicle. This was a large black machine, at least three times the size of the cab they had ridden in earlier. Its windows were tinted the same shade of black, and a man in livery stood beside the door, open at the back. Helene didn't have to know very much about this world to realize that Toshiro was clearly a man of some importance, perhaps even a minor lord. 
It explained this expansive vehicle and the difference the police had shown him. It seemed as though, somehow, they had acquired the support of one of the local leaders of this strange community. Inside the car was vastly more luxurious than the cab had been. There were two sets of very comfortable seats facing each other. Pixel and Helene laid score out on the back seat, and Helene sat with his hat in her lap. I could get to like this style of travel, score managed to joke. You've got a very nice lap. Cozy. Don't get too used to it, she warned him, feeling her face burn in embarrassment. You won't be traveling like this again. Then I promised to enjoy it as much as possible this time, he told her. His eyes closed and he seemed to drift into sleep. Helene brushed his hair back out of his eyes. She wasn't sure how she felt exactly, but she knew she didn't want to lose him, no matter how irritating he could be. After the liveried servant closed the door, he went to the front of the car and started it up. From where he sat, Mr. Toshiro studied the three in silence. Helene had not enjoyed the cab ride at all, but this was very different. For one thing, the windows cut down on the glare from the city, as well as most of the noise. For another, this car was much smoother and gentler. And finally, there was a lead on the amulet at last. Pixel leaned forward from where he sat at Score's feet. You said you know about the locket, he prompted their host. Mr. Toshiro nodded. Indeed, I do. I do not have it myself, but I have an idea as to where it is. What do you know about the locket, demanded Helene. She was glad to be out of jail, but she was still not sure she was ready to trust their rescuer. And why are you helping us? I know that it is enchanted, the host replied. It is being used to drain the life force from your young friend. If you do not find it, he will die, he smiled slightly. Unlike most people on this planet, I accept that magic is real, and I know this is being done by magic. As to why I'm helping you, he shrugged. Partly, it is because you need help. Partly, it is because I, in turn, require your assistance. Ah, Pixel nodded. So you want us to do something for you in return for your help. Precisely, Toshiro agreed. A trade to benefit us both, he nodded to the sleeping score. Especially, I think, Mr. Caruso. Fair enough, agreed Helene. But how is that? You know all of this. Score told us that most people on Earth don't know anything about magic. I am a curious person. Toshio answered. I do not believe that everything can be explained by science, though certainly science has its uses, he gestured around them. I have made a great success in the business world through technology. I am very wealthy, and I can have almost anything my heart desires, except for the one thing that I want the most. That remains out of the reach of science, but not of magic. He leaned forward. Knowing that I needed a fresh approach to my problem, I studied magic. Alas, I do not myself possess the talents to actually perform magic, but I know that it is a real phenomenon. I have certain people in my employ who can use it, but their power is very limited. Still, they were able to locate a strong source of magic for me, this amulet that you seek, and they were able to inform me that its owner had a tremendous amount of magic at his disposal. He nodded at score. Mr. Caruso there. So I decided that I would have to meet Mr. Caruso when he inevitably returned home. You see, we discovered that someone had magically poisoned the amulet to lure Mr. Caruso back to Earth from wherever he was. All I needed to do was intercept him before his unknown foe could find him. Pixel nodded. I'm beginning to understand some of this, he said. He looked at Helene. Those street thugs we ran into must have been employed by the person who has the amulet and they were trying to capture score mr toshiro found us before our unknown magician did it made sense but helene was still not sure she trusted the man she reached out with what little magic she still retained and checked him out she discovered that he was telling at least 
some of the truth. There was no touch of magic about him, so he was certainly not the wizard who was poisoning Score. But there was a trace of residual magic, which made sense which made sense if, as he had claimed, he employed magicians to work for him. What is the problem of yours? Helene asked him. It must wait for a short while, the businessman answered. You will understand it better if you see it, and I trust you will feel compassion. It will not take us long to reach my home, I assure you. The slight delay will not injure Mr. Caruso further. Helene felt a slight tingling in her mind, and then she realized that it had to be Pixel trying to talk to her telepathically, something he didn't want Toshiro to hear. She felt for her agate, or agate gemstone to enable her to make the link. It wasn't as clear as normal, but at least she could manage it. What is it? she asked him. He doesn't know that the two of us can do magic, too, Pixel explained. He thinks it's just score. I don't see any reason to make him think otherwise. Do you? Smart. No, she agreed. It's better if he underestimates us. He may be telling the truth, but I'd like to be sure that if before I, I'd like to be sure of that before we start trusting him. She broke off contact, and to make it seem as if she'd only been thinking to herself, asked, "Where is your home in this city?" "No," Toshiro replied. "It's on Long Island." "An island?" Helene asked. "Is that far from here?" Their host laughed. "You are obviously not a local," he replied. New York City is an island. Long Island is joined to it. The trip there will take us about 15 minutes once we reach my heliport. Helene had no idea what a heliport might be, but she found the idea that they were already on an island interesting. It made sense because towns on islands were easier to defend from enemies. Long Island was probably an ally of New York then. The car stopped and the door beside her opened. Another uniformed man held the door while Mr. Toshiro stepped out. Pixel and Helene managed to move Score from the car. He didn't even wake up. There was a wheelchair awaiting them, and Mr. Toshiro gestured at it. It will be easier to transport him in this, he suggested, though we do not have far to go. Helene lowered Score into the chair, and he woke slightly. Are we there yet, he muttered. Almost, Mr. Toshiro replied. Rest for now. Okay, he agreed and fell asleep again. Helene pushed the chair and followed Mr. Toshiro. They were beside a river on a long, flat, stone-like ground. There were several other cars parked and people hurrying around. There were also two strange machines, one of which seemed to have sprung to life. Helene had never seen anything like it before. It looked vaguely like a lo very large carriage though the wheels it rested on were quite small and attached to the ends of stalks. There was a glass-covered cabin with several doors behind it, one of which was open. A man in strange headgear ushered them towards it. The oddest part of this machine, that on its top, there were four long, narrow blades that looked to Helene like a windmill had fallen onto its back. The machine was making an even louder noise than the cars had earlier. Mr. Toshio clambered inside, and beckoned for them to follow. A pretty young woman and a man helped to get Score into one of the seats. Puzzled, Helene followed and strapped herself into another seat as she was told. Why had they moved from one car to another? It didn't make any sense to her. The young woman joined them, and the man uh, shut the door, enclosing them all inside the strange vehicle. Prepare for takeoff, the young woman said pleasantly. Take off? Helene asked, confused. I'm not taking anything off. I've got little, I've got little enough as a, on as it is. The woman looked totally confused, but Mr. Toshio found the whole thing very amusing. She doesn't mean for you to take anything off, he explained. It is that the helicopter, helicopter will be taking off momentarily. Helicopter? Helene asked. She wished she knew what this was all about. What is that? It's what we're in, Pixel explained. It flies. Flies? Helene was starting to get alarmed. But it has no wings or feathers. It's not even a dragon. How can it fly? The whole world lurched under her. There was a terrible noise overhead, which she realized had to be coming 
from the windmill blades. Then the ground dropped away. She felt as if she was going to be sick. Her eyes widened as she stared out of the windows and watched the cities fall away. She covered her mouth and held the contents of her stomach in place by sheer force of will. The young woman handed her a bag of some sort. Just in case, the woman said. Then to Pixel, she added, Hasn't she flown before? Oh, yes, he assured her. Just never in a machine. I don't think she likes it. Mr. Toshiro raised an eyebrow. Interesting. So she is from another world, then. Pixel nodded. Where dragons and rocks fly, but not machines. This can't possibly fly, Helene stated, trying not to look at the land passing below them. It is far too heavy, and it has no wings. It is flying, Pixel assured her, and it's very safe. Don't worry. That's easy for you to say, Helene complained as her stomach rebelled further. It was one thing to levitate herself and fly using magic, but magic on Earth wasn't strong enough for her to do that. There was no way that this helicopter could stay in the air. Helene was sure it was bound to crash and kill them all. She had not felt this sick or miserable for a long time. The next chapter is chapter six. Pixel didn't have the nerve to confess to Helene that this was his first helicopter ride too. He'd done plenty of flying in virtual reality, but he'd never physically. On the other hand, since he was from a world even more technologically advanced than Earth, he could accept it and take it in stride. He found the flight fascinating and spent most of it staring out the windows at the ground below. He'd imagined this New York had to be a fairly large place, even on Earth, because it seemed to be back-to-back buildings for the entire flight. As Toshiro had promised, the flight lasted barely 15 minutes before the machine settled down on a concrete plat pad close to a large house overlooking a bay. The view was beautiful, especially since the weather was so nice. The gardens of the house had been immaculately landscaped, and the whole place reeked of wealth and power. Helene was the first out. Eagerly leaving the vehicle, she and Pixel watched the young woman and a man who had met the helicopter help the sleeping score into the wheelchair again. I'm glad he didn't see me, Helene muttered to Pixel. He'd never let me forget it if he knew how scared I was. She glared at Pixel. Don't you dare breathe a word about it. Pixel blushed slightly. Of course not, he promised. Toshiro had joined them and gestured for them to follow him. My aid will bring your friend. He told them, no, Helene said firmly, I will bring our friend. Toshiro bowed slightly, as you wish. Pixel realized that Helene was still very cautious about trusting their host and wanted to keep score close to her. He felt a pang of jealousy about this, but then rebuked himself for feeling that way. Helene was just looking after score. There was nothing more to read into it. Toshiro led the way through the beautiful gardens toward the house. There was a large pond beside the path, with a waterfall at the far end. Pixel saw the flicker of color below the water and realized it was stocked with fish. Carefully tended plants and trees gave the area a lovely look. The house was only two stories high, with sleek lines and large windows. It had to be large enough to hold at least 50 people. But there was no way of telling just how many were really there. Pixel was still unused to the real world. 
How many people would it take to run a place like this? Pixel found the inside of the house to be as rich as the exterior. There were works of art, subtle but significant, showing taste as well as money. The furniture was functional and spread out carefully to allow plenty of room for the wheelchair. The young woman from the helicopter vanished, leaving them alone with their host. As I promised you earlier, Toshiro told Pixel and Helene, I will now explain the nature of my problem. As you can see, I am a wealthy and powerful man, he gestured around the room. Whatever I wish within limits, I can have. But what I want the most, I am denied. Pixel narrowed his eyes and studied the man. So what do you want from us, he asked suspiciously. Nothing harmful, I assure you, Toshio answered. Your friend Score is able to perform magic. Is he not? Yes, Pixel confirmed. Toshiro already knew at least that much. What I require is for him to do one small task for me. If it's so small, Helene asked suspiciously, why can't one of your own magicians do the trick? Because they are not that strong, Toshiro explained. Oh, they were able to trace score and find out about the amulet for me. But beyond that, they are virtually powerless. Since Score was able to cross from Earth to another world and bring you back with him, I imagine he must be a great deal more powerful than they are. What is beyond their abilities should be within his grasp. Perhaps, agreed Pixel with a shrug, but we need to know what you want before we can tell you whether he can manage it. Toshiro nodded. Please wake him up and I will show you the nature of my problem. Helene hesitated, but then bent down to shake score. Wake up, she murmured. It's time to get to work. Pixel shook his head and then opened his eyes. Oh, score shook his head and then opened his eyes, which were red rimmed and unfocused. Oh, great. Just what I need in this condition. We don't have a lot of choice, Pixel told him. Mr. Toshiro has offered to help us track down the locket if you help him first. Well, that's something at any rate, Score sighed and struggled to sit upright. I feel so drained, though. Can I sit this one out? You're just trying to make me do all the work, Com Helene complained. But I, but I suppose so, she pushed him along after Toshiro, while Pixel brought up the rear. They went down a long corridor and into another room. Pixel's eyes widened as he looked around. There was a large mainframe computer and several workstations around the room. It was, it was he realized, probably state-of-the-art equipment from this world. It looked like an antique to him, but he knew it had to be very powerful. There was one person in the room waiting for them, a girl. Pixel immediately recognized why there they had been plenty of room for Scorer's wheelchair. The girl was in one of her own. She was petite and dark-haired very pretty and about Pixel's own age. It was clear that she was quite dependent on her wheelchair. My daughter, Destiny, Toshiro explained, and he introduced the three of them to her. Destiny gave a slight bow of her head. I am pleased to meet you, she welcomed them. She saw Pixel glance admiringly about the room. You like my playthings? It's quite a setup, he said with a smile. You must be able to do a lot with this. I can do more with this equipment than most research universities, Destiny said proudly. Then she scowled, except the one thing that I most desire, escape from my prison. Pixel couldn't help feeling sorry for her. To be trapped like she was wouldn't be easy for anyone, especially someone as adventurous as Destiny appeared to be. I'm sorry about that, he told her honestly. Isn't there any medical help for you? No, Toshiro said, and believe me, if there were, I would have gladly paid for it. This is what my money cannot buy me, my daughter's freedom to move about as she desires. Score managed a very weak laugh. That's what you want us to do, he asked. Cure destiny? He tapped his own chest with a shaking hand. Trust me, if any of us had any healing ability, I wouldn't be in this shape right now. Pixel winced. Score had been asleep when he and Elaine had agreed that they'd keep their powers quiet, as he feared to Shiro's brow furrowed. You are all magicians? 
he asked. Destiny stared at them, and Pixel could fear the, the stirrings of magic in the air. Yes, they are, she breathed. And so are you, Pixel answered, knowing she was the one who had made the magic stir. Your father neglected to mention that. There did not seem to be any point, Toshio answered. I assume your own oversight was for the same reason? Three magicians, Destiny said, a terrible longing in her voice. Well, perhaps none of you alone can help me, but all three of you and my own small contribution might surely... Pixel didn't want to raise her hopes any further. I don't know, he said, speaking frankly. Healing isn't any one of our talents. We've never really tried it. Please, Destiny begged. You must help me. You're my only chance, and then I can help you in seeking out Score's amulet to cure him. Pixel didn't know what to say. He exchanged a glance with Helene and saw that the same thought must have crossed her mind. If there was a chance of helping Score, they had to try it. I think we could use some advice, Pixel finally said. He held in his mind the calling spell, one of the very first they had ever learned, and then summoned Oracle by reciting his name backwards. Well, this is an improvement on that jail cell, Oracle remarked, looking around. You seem to be moving up in the world. It may not be their jail cell, Destiny said, but it's certainly mine. Oracle raised an eyebrow. Making new friends as usual, he asked pleasantly. She needs our help, Pixel explained. Ah! Oracle nodded. A personality transplant, I take it. She wants us to heal her, Helene said. We thought you might know if it is possible, Pixel added. We never tried to do anything like it. He sprang his hands helplessly. And Helene couldn't bring her book of magic with her, so we can't even check for new spells. You have a book of spells? Destiny asked, obviously impressed. Ones that actually work? She gave a sharp laugh. I've read plenty of here on Earth that claim to work, but they never do. These do, Helene admitted. But I don't remember there being any healing spells. Oracle shook his head. Healing is a rare art, he replied. Not many magicians can do it. He crossed to Destiny's wheelchair and bent to examine her legs. Simple stuff? Sure, no problem. Speeding up healing for a cut or mending broken bones isn't too hard. It's a matter of manipulating time, mostly. So it takes two minutes instead of two months. But curing someone who can't walk isn't that simple. He glanced up. How long have you been like this? Since I was born, she said bitterly. I've never been able to walk. Then speeding up time isn't going to do the slightest bit of good, Oracle announced. There's nothing there for it to work on. If they are going to help you, it'll have to be some other way. He stood up. Well, it's out of my depth, so I'd better go and get an expert opinion. If it's possible, Shannara should know about it. I'll be back when I have an answer. He promptly vanished. Toshio raised an eyebrow. Is he always like that? Always, Pixel confirmed. You do get used to it eventually. He seemed rather rude, Destiny commented. That's just his way, Score told her. Look, if you don't mind, I'm just going to doze a while to conserve my strength. There's not much I can do right now anyway. His eyes closed again and Pixel and Helene exchanged worried looks. Score was clearly getting worse. And they were no closer to finding the locket and carrying him. Pixel decided it was time to get tough. Look, he said blatantly. He said bluntly to Destiny. As you've seen... We're trying to help you. Now, isn't it about time you helped us a bit in return? What do you know about the amulet? Destiny nodded. Of course, 
Let's use the time wisely while we're waiting for Oracle. Come here, she gestured to her computer screen. Pixel drew closer as Helene did. What's that thing? she asked, staring at the screen. A computer, Destiny answered. Haven't you ever seen one before? She's from a world that's still medieval, Pixel explained. All this stuff is completely new to her. Oh, Destiny chewed her lip for a moment. I guess this is a bit like a scrying pool where you can call up whatever you want on a screen instead of a pool of water. Only it works because it's science, not magic. It's very useful. She tapped a couple of keys and a picture sprang to life. It showed a small silver locket. This is what you need to find. I managed to make an image of it after, magic, after viewing it magically. She sighed in frustration. I know it's around here in, somewhere in the area, somewhere in New York. I just don't know where. I've used my magical skills and my computer, and all I get is an idea it's, uh, that it's around. Take a look. She gestured to an image on the monitor. Got this. Kind of looks like a building. Kind of looks like a maze. Do you see it? So, it doesn't make a lot of sense, agreed Pixel. But magic's like that sometimes. It can get very frustrating. Without letting anyone know what he was doing, Pixel closed his hand around the ruby in his pocket and concentrated on the image of the locket. Again, he could only sense it was reasonably close. And to the west. Obviously, as, De as Destiny had guessed, it was in New York somewhere. Did you miss me? Oracle asked as he entered the room again. Well, I've possibly got good, some good news for you. There may be a way to cure Destiny. Perhaps even two ways. Two? Destiny sat upright, her face eager. One will do. Tell me. It's nice to have an enthusiastic audience, Oracle said appreciatively. Well, the easiest way is a healing spell. I wasn't sure that there was an appropriate one, but Shinar knew one. He held up a sheet of paper with the spell written on it for them to read. Theoretically, it should work. Practically, he spread his hands. The problem is that it takes a lot of magical energy. Neither Shannara nor I could be certain that you'd have enough power on Earth for this to work. The only way to know would be to try it. It's worth a try, surely. It's worth a try, surely, Pixel agreed. Definitely, Destiny eagerly agreed. Helene held up her hand. What about the second way, she asked. Oh, that, Oracle grinned. The same thing, only this time, on Treen. If you move there through a portal, then your power levels would increase, and you should have enough to affect a cure. Destiny frowned. Well, if you're sure that would work, why not simply do that instead? Because it will only work on Treen, Oracle explained. If you were then to return to Earth, you'd resume your current condition. So, if we were to do that, you'd have to become an exile from Earth. He gestured around. Could you really give up all of this so easily? To be free at last, Destiny said. Easily. To be able to walk, dance, jump, anything would be worth it. Also, Oracle added, there's no guarantee you would survive the trip to Tree. Your magical abilities might not be powerful enough. Well, let's try it here first, Pixel said. Going to Treen can be our backup plan. We'd have to go to Central Park anyway, where the portal is. He looked at Helene and Destiny. Did you both memorize the spell? They nodded. Good. Then let's link our powers and see if we're strong enough for it. He held out a hand to each girl. They gripped him and then each other. Focus, he commanded. It was very strange doing this with Destiny instead of Score. Linking up in the past had seemed almost natural. The easiest thing in the world's. Now, though, it felt slightly unbalanced. Pixel could feel Destiny's personality, very different from Score's. 
all part of the merger. They were connected magically. Pixel could feel the magic build. Destiny was definitely gifted, but she was not as strong as Score. However, she was definitely stronger than Score was at the moment. Pixel felt the magic growing and flowing about them as he began to recite the words of the spell. Sinoj, Aros, Ak. The words took shape and form, and he could feel the power starting to flow. It was as if he were being drained into Destiny's legs. He could almost see the nerves, the blood vessels, and the long, useless muscles. It was like a dark pit down which they were pouring the light of magic to illuminate and strengthen what was there. He could feel the muscles start to tense as power flowed into them for the first time. Somehow, he could sense that there was a tingling throughout Destiny's limbs as she concentrated. Pixel opened his eyes the power still moving within him. He looked down at Destiny's legs. Her toes were twitching slightly. She stared at them in awe. It's working, she breathed. I can feel my toes. Good, Helene said. Then the spell is doing its job. Perhaps, Pixel cautioned them, but it may not be quite enough. It's drained all of my strength for a while. But try to walk and see what happens. Destiny nodded eagerly. She pushed back the blanket covering her. She had shorts on underneath it. Showing off her long legs, her skin was pale, but the muscle tone looked good. She gripped the arms of her chair and pushed herself upward, strain and hope on her face. Her legs connected with the carpet, and she grunted as she struggled to stand up. Pixel wanted to help her, but he knew that he shouldn't. She had to try this alone. Slowly, she managed to struggle upright and then stood there, wobbling slightly, her eyes wide with excitement. It's working. She breathed. I'm standing up. I'm... Her legs buckled. And she fell forward with a cry of disappointment and rage. Pixel and Helene managed to grab her before she slammed into the floor. They lowered her gently back into the wheelchair. Pixel could feel the shock and anger coursing through her body. It failed, she cried, slamming her bald fist down on the armrest. It was so close, and yet it failed. It was almost enough, Helene argued. A little more power, and it would have worked. Then take me to Treen, Destiny begged. You can surely cure me there. Pixel's heart was almost broken by the hunger and despair in her voice. They had to help her somehow. We may not need to go to train, he told her. The problem is that your strength isn't as much as scores. If we were linked with his, I'm sure it would work. Then let's wake him up and try it, Destiny said. No, Pixel shook his head. Once he's cured, then we can cure you. Right now, he has no strength to spare, so it's imperative that we find the locket fast. That way, we'll be able to cure both of you. I understand, Destiny smiled. I'll do all I can to help you find it. In fact, she broke off as several people suddenly came into the room. Three of them were holding guns. The last man wasn't. He was tall, good-haired, dark-haired, and dressed in an impeccable fawn-colored suit. He smiled at them without humor. Good afternoon, he said. My name's Tony Caruso. I've come for my son. And that's the end of chapter six. We're going to leave off here. Um, next week, next Monday, uh, I'm going to start reading at chapter seven 
here on book five of Diadem Worlds of Magic by John Peel. Uh, again, if this is your first time listening, um, the entire book series, um, I've been reading it from the beginning, from book one, chapter one, um, and you can actually find that um, easily just by going here uh, to books. Uh, and you'll find a link. Oh, hold on. I accidentally added an extra character there. Uh, you'll find a link to the um, the YouTube playlist. Actually, I think it's book. I need to make it books, too. I need to make it book and books. But there we go. Um, you'll find the link there on YouTube for the playlist. Um, it is available. I'm going to have this recording up. I think there might be one more recording that I need to add to the playlist. Um, but this one will be added after that. Um, every single recording from every single stream, from every single um, live book reading um, has been recorded in entirety and uploaded to YouTube. So if you uh, missed any part of the book series or want to go back and um, listen to the parts that you've missed, that is available. Um, also, uh, I'm going to end this stream um, so I can uh, upload, download the recording and upload it. Uh, I'm going to come back. I'm going to stream again. Um, probably do a little bit of uh, gaming. So if you're into that, I'll be here. Um, what do we got going on? What's our uh, what's what's the room look like? We got a few people in here. Should we raid out? Lovely, are you still here? Should we should hand this group off? Looks like we we uh, we only got a couple folks. Okay, there's just a, there's just a few. So we will not be raiding out, but um, we will be uploading this recording. I love y'all. I'll see you on the next one. Bye, besties.